Yep. Hello, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show for July 11th, 20 great teen. It's still a great year to be playing PC, computer, video games. Uh, you may notice I have a better mic now. Do I sound better, guys? Do I sound decent? Your mic immediately cut out on you. Son of a gun! <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. It, it's it's, it's like there's some sensitive spots here, so I gotta find the sweet spot, figure it out as we go. Uh, but yeah. I think it's just a, an internet thing, you know. Oh, internet really? It's not like, doesn't like voices. Oh, sometimes. shoot. Okay, well, we'll troubleshoot that. At least when you can hear me, I probably sound a little better. Uh, also sounding very nice online with me is, uh, wow, I, got, I have you guys mixed up here. I'll, I'll, I'll switch to that. We have <laughs> Wes Fenlon, uh, Features Editor, and Chris Livingston. How you guys doing? Hello. Hi. We're both doing well. I will I'll field that question for both of us, Wes. <laughs> I, I wish I could. Can we swap personalities? Like, I, it's kind of a lot of pressure to just become uh, as funny as Chris is and as handsome. But I could try it. Mm. Give it a go. I don't. I don't think it's a good trade for you, Wes. I think you're doing fine. <laughs> oh God, my. Uh... You have a cute dog named Hank. I mean, I do. There's a, of, there's a lot of benefits. I feel like to being Chris. Let's see. The dog. The dog is a good. Is a good swap. I'll say that. Uh, now I have your names correct. You know, Discord did the exact thing I thought it was going to do and switched your faces around, but <laughs> one foible down. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, last week we had July 4th off to celebrate America, uh, of course. Um, but this week we have to celebrate computer games yet again. Uh, a lot of Battle Royale games came out in the last couple weeks, or at least like entered some stage of alpha or, or testing. So we're going to talk about those. Uh, we got some Monster Hunter PC news, including release date, system requirements, uh, mod information, and so on. We're going to run over. Uh, Fortnite Season 5 is nearly here, so we're going to talk about what we expect from that, and then maybe talk about ARGs and what makes a good ARG versus a bad ARG, because I have feelings about Fortnite's take on that. Uh, and then so we'll... tomorrow for Fortnite, right? Yeah, tomorrow morning. Thursday. Yeah. So, uh... Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they come out with, but soon, soon. I'll probably be up late tonight because I can't help myself. Uh, and then we're going to talk with you guys, uh, listener questions. We'll field a bunch of questions, as always, from you. Uh, but let's get started with what we've been playing, first of all. And it's been two weeks or so um, since we last spoke. What y'all been playing? Any video games, perchance? Shit, I feel I'll put on the spot now. Yeah. I'm supposed, to play, <laughs> I'm supposed to play a game? Chris, you go first. Uh, yeah, well, I guess I have been playing a brand new game you've probably never heard of called Daisy. Um, <laughs> it's uh, so, yeah, I, uh, after about three and a half years away from Daisy, I, I started playing in like January of 2014. Mm -hmm. It came out, this is the standalone, it came out in end of 2013. I played it for most of the year. I, I stopped in October of 2014, and I just went back uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm still playing not a ton, but maybe uh, you know a few hours a week here and there. Um, it's really it's really strange. It's 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 you know it was in early development when I left three and a half years ago. Mm. Since then, they've created a new engine for it and are starting to bring the features over into this new engine on an experimental server. So it's in a way playing on this experimental server, it's almost like I'm playing, it's almost like I didn't miss any time at all because it's this sort of partially complete game with yeah. a lot of this. I mean, there, there have been a lot of changes, but it's still like, it's not feature complete. There's stuff that doesn't work. There's stuff that's missing. So it's weird. It's like in a way I didn't, it feels like I didn't miss a step at all. It's just like, oh yeah, some stuff works, some stuff doesn't. Um, so it's really strange to just like, hey, I'm gonna skip three and a half years of your game's development and come back and feel like I'm nothing. Is I nothing. haven't missed anything in a way, which isn't really fair. There are there are a lot of changes, and the, the new engine definitely uh, runs a lot better. I get get really good frame rates most of the time. It looks great, um, and there have been some changes too, but it's. It's sort of weird to just kind of shut a game out of your life for three and a half years and come back, and it's largely in kind of the same state it was at the time. So it's weird, but I'm having fun. 
I thought they had started moving it to that new engine like three or four years ago, but I guess that was the standalone version was not the new engine. Um, yeah, it was. Well, they I think they started building this new engine for it a, a while ago. They only recently kind of put it up on experimental servers. I think maybe like in May or something. They started letting people play on it. Um, gotcha. Man, they have been. It has been. Uh, they have been working on it as far as I know for a long time but this is kind of the first look we're getting it Chris have you told the story on the podcast before of why you stopped playing Daisy I feel like I probably did um I'll give a short version I was writing a freelance piece I needed some sort of hook for it for playing Daisy and I thought I'll find out what it feels like to play a game knowing that if you died in the game you never play it again. It would be this perma perma death <laughs> thing. I want to see what effect it would have on me as a player, like knowing that if someone starts shooting at me, it could be the end of the game for the rest of my actual life. Um, so yeah, I died immediately. I would did the stupidest. I, it was like I had never played before. I made the most basic mistake you can make. I died almost immediately, and I had planned to keep this promise for my whole life, but after a while. It just sort of seemed like it's not teaching me anything. The idea was to learn something in the moment while I was playing, and I learned that I'm an idiot, and that's <laughs> that's not really breaking news. Um, it's it's almost like that moment as an adult when you first realize like you can just buy ice cream whenever the hell you oh want. God. It. Just be like, yeah, it's, it's 11 p.m. at night, and you're like, I could just go get some right now. Right. I could just play Daisy again right now. Yeah. Like, no one can actually stop me. That's right. Um, and it just kind of seemed pointless. I think three people probably are still aware of it. Um, and plus, I it was a game I really enjoyed, and I wanted to check it out again. And if I'm gonna if I'm gonna weasel around the promise, I can always say, well, it's a different engine, so therefore a different game. Even though that's bullshit. But <laughs> um, anyway, it's it's still fun. It's it's still this this weird. I don't know. There's this weird type of game that I like that when a game is basically in a way a single player game until all of a sudden it's not like it's like i play it like a single player game i don't really crew up with friends i just sort of go run around for hours on my own and then suddenly you'll turn a corner and there'll be another human being there um and i kind of i just really enjoy that like there's a there was a, a multiplayer mode in Watch Dogs and Watch Dogs 2 which is like that you'll just you'll be playing a single player game and suddenly you find out there's another human being in your game with you. Um, and there's just something about that I really enjoy. Um, and Daisy is, is still like that. I will play for a while and then suddenly run to someone and it's uh, fun. And hopefully it will be finished. Right. Time this year, they, someday. Sometime this year, they said, but we've heard things like that before. So we'll Maybe see. they'll remake we'll it see. one more time, just for old time's sake. Maybe. Yeah. What about you, Wes? I'm at least glad that it's not going anywhere. Like, yeah. the player base is way, way smaller than it was, you know, in its heyday. But there's still going to be people playing Daisy for a long time. Yeah, I think um, I think there's like about 3,500 a day, which is not anywhere, like you said, near its heyday. But there's still people playing and talking about it. And so, yeah. So I have not been playing Daisy. Um, I've mostly been playing. Uh, non-PC stuff, though I have been playing some of it on my PC. I think a couple weeks ago I mentioned I was playing Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, I've been emulating that, and I've been pretty deep into that game, like getting my characters uh, the ninja dual-wield skill so they can just run around with two swords just fucking wrecking shop. Uh, that's been fun. But the past couple days I've actually been playing uh, a game that I, I guess I'm not really supposed to talk about yet. The embargo is uh, tomorrow, but it's the Bard's Tale 4. Uh, they're putting out a pretty chunky beta for like the Kickstarter backer community. Um, that you know the game was Kickstartered, I guess, three years ago, uh, something like that. So they've been working on it for a long time, uh, and I've been playing this beta build, which I, I've put probably four or five hours into it and am not finished with it yet. So it's a pretty decent, it, it's it's like simultaneously a decent chunk of the game and also just feels like the very beginning of the game. And everything I've talked, uh, heard from the developers and talking to them makes me feel like this is a pretty small slice of the, of the whole world. 
uh, that you can play in this in this beta. But it's been pretty fun so far. I traditionally am not like a big dungeon crawler player. Uh, I played the original Bard's Tale with my dad as a kid, and I think we would get about. We'd spend 20 minutes in like the character creator making your party, and then we would take about 10 steps into the town, get lost, and then get murdered uh, by like 73 brigands or some shit like that. So, <laughs> I, I ha that's about my only real uh, early 90s experience with those kind of classic dungeon crawlers, and I've probably played a few games since then that kind of fit in that dungeon crawler mold but not not really that many so i'm really curious what people who are like diehard fans of eye of the beholder and like these old school dungeon crawlers are gonna feel about this game because it's combat is very different but the feeling of just walking through a dungeon or like a castle and finding puzzles and then fighting kind of patrols of enemies and stuff like feels pretty true to the to the genre, and I've been having a lot of fun playing it. How, uh, I mean, I don't know what you can say or what is known about this game, really, but how, how systemic uh, is something like The Bard's Tale compared to uh, uh, Ultima Underworld or, or something like that? Like, how simmy and, and strange does very, it Very, very different. Okay. Yeah, I would say not really simmy at all. Um, the puzzles are very much, like, kind of classic RPG puzzles where you'll walk into a room and you'll have like some symbols that you need to um, to match up. Uh, I know I can talk about these because they were in like earlier previews of the games. They have these little uh, cog puzzles that are pretty cool where you'll have sort of this like hex grid array with a bunch of cogs on it and you can usually slide them up and down on sort of different uh, tracks. And the first mm -hmm. couple you do are like super <clears throat> simple. You like slide one cog to the left and it hits another cog and then that spins both of them and the gate opens. Uh, but they very quickly get pretty complex where you'll have some cogs on like a swinging arm. So you have to swing it like 90 or 180 degrees and then you have other ones you have to move out of the way and like certain ones need to be spinning to open a door while other ones can't be spinning because they apply to traps. So you have to figure out the right combination for gotcha. those. And already just like a couple hours into the game, those get like decently complicated. Like I spent five minutes just sliding cogs around trying to solve one. So if that kind of keeps pace for the full game, I imagine they get really complex. It's the kind of thing in a review or like in a preview or I don't know, I would write and say, ah, just some more cog puzzles, more laser and mirror puzzles, <laughs> but would actually secretly love <laughs> because I just love, I uh, love some brain teasers like that. It sounds kind of fun. That's exciting. Yeah. There've been a few so far where I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm, I've done this sort of puzzle in a game yeah. a million times and I'm not like super psyched about it. But then there've been some other ones where I was, I was like, oh, this is cool. I like this. And some of it, I think, just depends on the vibe of the game and, like, the environment that you're walking around. Like, mm -hmm. if, if a puzzle isn't some groundbreaking, brilliant thing you've never seen before, but it just, like, fits into this cool feel feeling of, like, this is a really pretty-looking, like, RPG fantasy-ass dungeon with, like, glowing mushrooms and, like, you know... <laughs> fog and like shafts of light coming through windows and cool statues and like when the ambiance is there and then it's like oh I'm, this wizard made a stupid ass puzzle for you to solve it's like <laughs> all right i'm kind of i'm kind of into this all right so it's been fun it's been fun uh i'll have a write-up on it tomorrow where i can actually talk you know in detail about the game cool and, that, and that's the bard's tale what number is this four number four. number four number yeah. four it's a know. complete divergence from the Bard's Tale 3 which had like ninjas and Isn't that a comedy Nazi one? Yeah. Nazis? No, that's that was just the Bard's Tale reboot. Oh, right. Okay. The the first two Bard's Tale games I guess take themselves semi-seriously and mm -hmm. then the third one added like time traveling ninjas and stuff. I think it got real weird. Um and then there was the the comedy one which was actually in Exile's first game, which is Kind of interesting. Huh. It was after Brian Fargo left uh, Interplay and founded In Exile, and their first game was the the Bard's Tale reboot, which was sort of like a lampooning of RPGs, I guess. Gotcha. I never played it. Cool. Anything else, Wes? Supposed to be all right. Uh, that's about it. I think my that's my game in time lately. Right on. 
Yeah, I, 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 you guys have been playing far more than me because it's been Fortnite. Uh, not even a lot of Fortnite. Just I've been paying attention to it, partially because it's my job, and partially because I like it. Um, it's I, I completed all the challenges in season four, uh, except the ridiculous uh, XP grinds for these two additional like uh, character skins. That are oh they, they require hours and hours and hours of play that I just man I, I I lose a lot in that game and I just don't think I could bear losing that much so I, I just stop those skins though not that bad they're not even that good honestly all right um, good but yeah is it like is it super difficult to grind for stuff if you're not if like if you're getting killed all the time is that seems... yeah, well it's just the 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 things you earn XP for in in, in Fortnite are, it, I don't know, they're sort of equalized, strangely. The, the, for kills, you don't get much XP. For surviving, you get a decent amount. Um, there's something like discovery or exploration uh, as a factor, and I think that is tied to like how many chests you open, yada, yada. It all feels like really sort of arbitrary and flat. Um, and... I think the most you can earn per game is pretty low as well. So some of these like later uh, um, uh, levels require, gosh, I don't know, like 40,000 XP and you're earning like 300 per game on average. And it, it just takes so fucking long uh, that it's, it's not as fun or rewarding um, or even close to as interesting as just doing the battle pass and the challenges. Uh, Especially to get like what you get shoulder blades for some dark generic looking superhero supervillain skin. It's pretty lame, but whatever. It's, uh, if if you got it, congrats. Enjoy your Omega. But uh, it's too much for me. Um, I've mostly been paying attention. Jealous. What's that? James is secretly jealous of your I skin. I am pretty. I like I like those skins a lot, and uh, we'll, we'll be talking maybe a bit about that later on the show. I, I've also been playing um, very slowly. Hollow Knight, yet again. Uh, I'm doing a second playthrough. I'm just chipping away at it on the, my Nintendo Switch this time. Uh, I didn't play it since... Or the last time I played it, excuse me, was before all these free updates came out. So I'm enjoying finding out what those are and how they tie into the greater experience. Um, you can play as... Can you play as Hornet now? Or is that update still not out yet? You know, I don't even know. I feel like they were saving that for the Switch version. So maybe you can... Uh, maybe you have to win, or excuse me, beat the game once, or it's like a new game yeah, plus Yeah, it might thing. be a new game plus kind of um, deal. I feel like I would have known if that came out, but I know that was definitely a thing. Eh. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll find out soon. But yeah, that's pretty much it. It's it's summer, and I'm traveling a lot, and uh, video games are, are they're great, but I'm enjoying uh, sunshine and getting sunburnt and then regretting going outside a little bit more in the meantime. Yeah, I just remembered I did play another thing oh, yeah. uh, in the past two weeks. Um, I went and did a demo of Zone of the Enders 2, the second Ooh. runner, in VR. Tell which me is more. Coming out on PC in sep September, I believe. Like early September, it's launching on PC and also on PS4, I think. Um, you don't have to play it in VR. That's just a totally optional mode they added. You can play it as it always was, but now in 4K, you know, nice high-res graphics, <clears throat> excuse me, it looked really, really nice. Uh, that game holds up super well graphically, like the 4K textures and stuff. Uh, you know, it still looks like a game of its generation in terms of, like, mm -hmm. the, the number of polygons, like how detailed the models are, that kind of thing. But the, uh, the mechs, the designs are so good that they still look fantastic. And the only thing that kind of doesn't look amazing is like the backgrounds which are pretty irrelevant anyway it's all about just beating shit up blowing stuff up with the mechs so uh that game's gonna be pretty rad to replay on pc in high res and i actually had a lot of fun playing it in vr i don't know how many people in our audience actually have uh htc vibes to play zone of the enders with but if you do it's definitely worth trying it out that way Cool. I've never played it, so maybe my first time will be in VR. 
they had to build a whole new um, HUD and like interface and everything for playing it first person because it's a third person game originally, hmm. but it integrates really well. Like it feels like a natural part of the game. Uh, some of the VR like aiming and movement is like a little clunky, but it works pretty well. I, I while playing it, I couldn't really think of a way they could have done it better. So I think for it being a god fifteen year old game, uh, yeah, something like that, good like, there, huh? it's it's uh, really well done. Cool. Well, those are those are the like two games we've all played. Um, at PC Gamer as a collective editorial staff. Uh, yeah, uh, well, we, we have a couple more games to get to, some Battle Royale games, because there are a shitload of those. We'll get to those in a minute, but there's one game I know at least Wes will be playing with me. I don't know if Chris is all about it, but Monster Hunter World was oh, yeah. uh, the PC version. was uh, Release date was finally announced as well as you know some the system requirements, uh, and uh, we, we had a, an interview with one of the producers um, and got some extra details out of the whole thing. But uh, Chris, what do you know about Monster Hunter? <laughs> What's up um, I have, you know, I've actually watched some videos and some streams of the console version. I'm, I'm intrigued. It feels like something I might could possibly get into um, mostly for like, I don't know. I want to say the crafting stuff sounds appealing to me for some reason. Um, but yeah, you enjoyed yeah. Uh, the division, right? Uh, I enjoyed I the division in some ways. <laughs> like I enjoyed w- when James was reviewing it, he needed people to play with, and so I think I played with you for like a week until you, yeah. until you got like some major levels, and I was like, oh, I can't play with you anymore. You're too, you're too <laughs> boss. Um, but I enjoyed that. Like I enjoyed any time we kind of jump into a game with, with some of you guys. It's always fun. So. I feel like Monster Hunter is very much the Japanese version of, you know, a division or a destiny. I mean, it's been around way longer than, yeah. than those games, obviously, but it, it kind of scratches the same itch of this uh, game with a very long, a very long grind, basically, to kind of get everything, but with lots of reasons to keep hunting the same creatures, you know, mm-hmm. over and over again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm gameplay wise maybe not too much in common with division <laughs> not quite how it actually <laughs> how it actually feels to play it right um but just the kind of quirky japanese nature of monster hunter makes it so much more appealing to me than destiny or the division ever was there's just like a feel to japanese action games that and and sometimes like bad system design that is still really appealing cuz it's just unique or just weird you know definitely and i think a lot of those like weird edges uh, in 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 monster hunter world have been sort of they're still there but they're streamlined um so they're not infuriating uh even if they do they appear archaic on on uh you know uh at first they are much easier to learn and things like ui and um uh Maybe like the workflow of, of the crafting system are just so much simpler this time. You can automate a lot of things, uh, and and it, it it does a better job explaining itself right out of the gate. Um, so you played a decent chunk of the console version, right? Yeah, uh, I played the entire. I guess <laughs> it's one of those games where you you quote beat it, uh, and then it's like, hey, by the way, now the real game starts. Um, so I spent a good, like, the, what, 15 hours beating the, the story campaign. mode is just prep, basically. For yeah, the yeah. And the, the story itself is pretty dumb. Uh, it's, like, it's 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 so hokey and, and thin, uh, but it doesn't really matter. There's monsters, James. What the fuck do you want? I guess it, it is about what it claims to be about. Um, and it, it's fun, but, like, it, the real meat, I would say, is, like, once, once you beat the game, uh, all these new systems and crafting options and armor and... and uh, methods of, of uh, hunting and uh, creatures uh, unlock, and it becomes like this big kind of open-ended, okay, what am I going to pursue now? And it's, it's, I think, before even getting to that, like if that kind of thing is off-putting to you, you don't have to touch that. I, I, those like 15 hours I played um, of the campaign, uh, the, the easy mode or whatever you might call it, it, were a ton of fun because you can hop into a game pretty easily with friends, 
wander around these big uh, maze-like environments and uh, hunt like beautiful, big uh, monsters with like unique behaviors that interact with each other and sometimes fight each other. Um, and doing that like over and over is is fun because the combat is is ex- extremely good. Like th- th- I forget how many weapons there are. Um, but each one, there's a ton of like variants, right? Of the weapons. Yeah. uh, There's, you know, you you have a lot of, oops, I think we lost someone on the the camera there. Lost Wes for a second. Um, there are a ton of variants and sorry, I don't know what happened. It's all good. (laughs) It's all good. Uh, that, you know, break down by some pretty obvious archetypes. You know, you have your, 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 your swords and your, your hammers and your, uh, axes and your uh, bows, but each of them is like very mechanical um, and has like controls, has some kind of system built into it that mu- like you would feel is reserved for its own character action game. So controlling every weapon is like almost, you know, uh, subscribing to a different, different game entirely. Uh, the hammer has like all these charge up systems and these unique combos that are all about sort of like holding your swing back and waiting for the perfect moment to strike before like really cracking a monster over the head and like dazing them. Uh, and a lot of the, uh, like the bows and such are all about sort of the timing of your strikes and accuracy. Um, and some, some of them have like almost like gears of war style, active reload mechanics tied into like how they behave. Uh, some of them are like uh, acrobatic. Like there are these blades that basically send you flying into the sky, uh, so you can hop on top of them easier and ride the dinos. And it's it's pretty crazy, like the diversity of the weapons. Um, and on top of like that, the diversity of how each monster behaves. Um, and you if know, we play together, what what will our roles be? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have a hard time not doing hammer again because I love it so much. It has this really good move where you can like charge. Uh, you hold down the R R two or whatever it will be on the PC, and then like if you hit an incline, you'll start sliding down the incline, and you'll feel uh, your hammer going duk, 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 like almost like a, a gear clicking as it gets more, it gains more charge. And then if you let go on an incline, you do this big like. You do like eight somersaults in the air with a big fucking hammer. Um, anyway, uh, Wes, I don't know what what do you what, in Dark Souls? Do you go big? Do you go dexterity, strength? What's your kind of? Do you like playing uh, from a distance? The first first time I played through Dark Souls, I did pretty um, classic, like sword and board. Sword and board. Well, I main, mainly use a lance. Actually, I use like the the Black Knight halberd. Oh, okay. Um, I played a bit of the Monster Hunter beta back when it was like before it launched on consoles, right, right. Uh, and I was pretty into the the daggers, like the dual daggers. Oh, yeah, those are a favorite. I liked a lot how of how mobile you were with those, and you would like. I don't think it was poison, but you would kind of. They had like a built-in buff that you mm-hmm. could basically like. Um, in addition to the sharpening system, I think you would kind of like buff yourself up and then attack super super quickly uh which was good for me because i tried to fight something with a hammer and i could not hit it (laughs) basically (laughs) ever (laughs) i would like start charging it up and then by the time that animation went off the monster was like in another part of the forest yeah yeah i I, you see i'm so like that kind of thing is satisfying to me it's it's like uh it's uh like the baseball of of monster hunter weapons you really want to like get that timing perfect uh, but like I don't baseball, know. Baseball, if you started swinging seven seconds before the, <laughs> the ball arrived. If baseball was played underwater, then that's what I would I would play. But, um, yeah, it's it, it, there's going to be a lot going on there um, when it comes out. And I guess we didn't even say the fucking release date. Whoops. Uh, it's August 9th, 2018. So that's under a month away. Uh, that's next month. That's very, very soon. Um, what, would, what would your weapon of choice be, Chris? No, do they have other li- them. When I think of hunting, I think of like stealth and traps, and I don't know, are there poisons or there like can there you set traps, traps for monsters? And I would prefer to like do my killing from as far away as possible. You, you'd probably be yeah. like one of the distance weapons, and there's like uh, distance weapons. I barely know. There's like a fucking cannon, basically, too. Um, there's a there's the gun lance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A gun that is also a lance. That sounds that sounds ideal. It converts, yeah, and so yeah, you can you can also lay traps down. Like part of the game is like you get better rewards if you instead of 
it's actually pretty fucked up because <laughs> you uh, you can trap a monster, right? It sounds like you're you're being merciful um, for better rewards. So if you trap them, you get more shit. They don't die. It's okay. Everyone gets away happy. Except you keep the monster, and then if you trap them, you can take them to a special, basically, death pit where you fight them again, except you have a bunch of... Uh, you have cannons, or crossbows and cannons surrounding the arena. You have, like, spike traps all around. You have a uh, big rock you can drop on their head. It's pretty fucked up. Uh, so it's worth more if you kill them in the Thunderdome, basically? Yeah, ba well, basically, you get, yeah, you get to kill them again <laughs> on your terms. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Monster Hunter World coming out next month. No mods at launch. We have a bunch of uh, coverage you can check out at PCGamer.com slash monster dash hunter dash world um but interview. it is gonna run 60 fps yes 60 fps it will be visually parody with console and i think a lot of people took that the wrong way i think uh i played it on a ps4 pro and it looks incredible on that thing so if you can play that that game with those textures at 4k resolution or whatever you know you, you can manage then it's gonna look very 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 good I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry too much about the the poor quality unless it's just a mess. Uh, and you know, if it's been I this, I think they they've been working on it. Yeah, you know, all year, right? They've been I would be surprised. It, so. Yeah, I would be surprised if it's if it's a mess. Um, so no mods at launch, but they does that mean they do plan to add mod support? They didn't say that either. They just said they we have nothing to announce at this time. So it might be something they're considering. Um, or something they just want to dodge and let die. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. Uh, the release schedule for DLC and free updates is not going to be, at least right away, um, uh, caught up with the consoles. They're going to stagger the DLC that's already been released on consoles and uh, uh, release them at a quicker pace on PC to hopefully catch up. But even then, it might not be you know, one-to-one -one when those things come out. But uh, yeah, either way, exciting. Finally happening. Uh, it was definitely, God, when did it come out? Was it this year? I don't know, it's been a long, was it last year? Yeah, January. Early this year. February. Early this year. It's been one of my favorite games this year, and I, like, I when I got to the real game, I decided to quit on console because I knew I'd want to play it on PC. Uh, and with with Steam, you know, friend support, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to be way easier to hook up with people who want to play with me. Uh, I'm excited. We will definitely have a, a PC gamer crew. You bet. Perhaps a, do they have a clan system where you can have a bunch of people in it? Yes, I didn't really, I didn't really mess around with it too much, and I don't know how robu how robust it is, but they have something like that. A hunters believe. Guild. Maybe? Yeah, that's what it is. The guilds, the guilds. I'm, I'm sure we'll we'll put together a guild then. You bet, you bet. Um, but speaking of hunting, uh, a lot of games about hunting each other came out. Uh, or at least alphas, early early access versions came out in the last couple of weeks. Battle Royale, it's it's still it's still trucking along. It's still a thing. Uh, and Chris, you're sort of our go-to for just any new shitty game that we're we don't want to play. <laughs> you get to do it. Uh, yeah, like this week alone, three three battle royale games. One, um, Islands of Nine, which I've been aware of for a long time, but it's finally hitting early access tomorrow. It's kind of like a sci-fi themed kind of looks like you're in crisis running around on sort of a sci-fi but a lot of jungle greenery um so i haven't played that one yet but uh this week alone i played uh fear the wolves which is from vostok who had made servarium their former gsc devs who made the stalker series um and fear the wolves is kind of like stalker plus battle royale it's in closed beta now. And it's a pretty intriguing combination, Stalker and Battle Royale. Yeah, it I, is. Yeah. Any, anytime I hear Stalker meets something, I'm like, I'm listening. I don't <laughs> care what the other half is of the equation. I'm, I'm interested because of the Stalker part, especially when it comes from actual former Stalker devs. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, Fear the Wolves is in closed beta currently. It enters early access on the 18th, I think. Um, and I had a... I, played yes was it yesterday it was this week um and it's in it, as a closed beta goes it even feels a, like it's in kind of rough shape um at least it was yesterday nothing kind of worked great like servers and frame rate and some of the there are a lot of 
kind of crashes and freezes and stuff. So it felt a bit on shaky ground in terms of performance, um, which hopefully they can get into better shape by next week. Um, but the matches I did get into were were pretty cool. I mean, I think it's a, I think, first of all, I think a, a first person only um, Battle Royale game is not a bad idea. I think a lot of people really, really like first person only uh, shooters, especially in Battle Royale. I think um, PUBG, for instance, I think about 40, 40% of players play on first person only servers just because it's fair it's you know when you're in a third person perspective game you're going to run into situations where someone has an advantage just of where they're standing um so i think i think that's a great move i think having a battle royale game with more pve elements um because in fear of the wolves you're in this irradiated area so there's these anomalies that can hurt you um there are times where an anomaly will happen and like to not take damage, you have to sprint, which is kind of its way of getting moving you through the zone quickly, so you're not just, you know, hanging around or camping. You have to run, or you're going to be hurt. Um, there's also mutated wolves, and they have said that's just the first type of mutant creature you're going to have to contend with out there. So I think that's really interesting um, to not just have the threat to your survival be the other players or a you know wall of electricity hurting you that there could be some real environmental challenges to overcome on your way to fight other people. I think that's kind of a neat, uh, kind of a neat thing to, to, to have in the game to give it um, kind of a new angle, I think. Are they going to change the name as they add more creatures? Yeah, I was going to say. To the Fear of the Wolves and Bears. and I think they should add just add the new animal to the name every time. So Fear of the Wolves, et cetera, et cetera. And Bears and Snakes and... How would you compare it to PUBG uh, or other battle royale games you played, like as a shooter? Like, how do you, how does it feel? Um, this, like in in the close bait I played, the shooting was like ridiculous. Like, we were shooting each other, just bang, bang, bang. I mean, there was so much blood and so many shots, and no one was going down. Like, I shot a guy at least three times in the face, and he didn't go down. And and like, it's not like he then turned around and one shot me. He shot me like fourteen times. I didn't go down. So something was up with the ballistics yesterday. I don't know. Like, players are really bullet spongy, hmm. which isn't necessarily terrible. Like, it does sort of suck to get one shot in a Battle Royale game after 25 minutes. Um, and I like, I kind of like the idea of, like, having an encounter with someone and nobody winning, and then you kind of slink off and kind of heal up and stuff like that. Um, but something was definitely up because, like, in several fights, like, we were a few feet away just pumping bullets into each other. And I at least didn't hadn't like armored up with a bunch of like gear and ballistic vests and stuff. So I think something was kind of off with the ballistics. Um, I mean, you'd really think three to the face would do, would do it. <laughs> yeah, that should be enough. In any in any case, that should be. Uh, so the state it was in when I played, I was like, wow, there's nothing. Is kind of feels really quite like it's working as intended. Um, but I, it's a game I do want to. To try again just because I love the stalker world. I love the idea of a really dangerous environment that doesn't have to do with other people shooting you. And the the um, the end game I thought was really interesting. Um, instead of there just being this you know final face off, there's a helicopter that flies over when you know the the grid has closed down to just one square, and it flies across so you can see it and you can see it on your map. And then it lowers a rope and there were six of us left and well i think we're all just kind of hiding like in the bushes and it's like you you know the helicopter will only take one passenger so if one of the six just runs and climbs a rope and gets in and he's 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 one but um you know you're just sitting there staring at this rope going like, everyone's just sort of waiting like who's going to be <laughs> stupid enough to go climb it meanwhile who's going to get lit up Meanwhile, the spectators, people who have been watching the match, get to vote periodically on what the weather uh, system is. If there's new weather, it could be rain, it could be fog, it could be uh, heat that can like affect other players um, who are still playing. So they picked Storm. So it was really this cool kind of dramatic moment because there was a lot of fog, there was rain and wind. Um, you couldn't really see the helicopter that well. You could barely see the rope. Plus, the helicopter drops like this smoke bomb to mark it. 
so there's this red smoke, there's fog, uh, driving rain, and there's and you can just see someone like climbing the rope, and then suddenly pop, 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 pop. Everyone else in the zone is just shooting at him. So it's kind of a fun little dramatic. It might kind of remind me of the division, uh, dark zone extractions where you know other people around looking at this helicopter, wanting to run over to the <laughs> rope, but is it that good of an idea? So I think there's for Fear of the Wolves. I think there's some interesting hooks that could uh make it a lot of fun so we'll have to see how it does in early access i mean yeah it's it's got a long way to go it sounds like but yeah it's it's also coming out under early access next week you said something like that yeah from now. yeah it's pretty surprising but uh yeah i feel like um i don't know i i think in early access people will put up with a lot of things like bugs and sure. things that they know will get improvement but um like so much of my time with fear of the wolves was just like sitting there on the screen trying to trying to start a match, trying to get into a match. And I think people don't have patience for that. I think you need a, a solid kind of stable framework to get people in there. Yeah. Um, so hopefully they can sort that out quickly. I cool. feel like at this point in the uh, pretty young life of the Battle Royale, it's been encouraging to me that I, I feel like they have more variety and creative spins on the genre than like the MOBA did at this point in it blowing up. Like I feel like everybody who followed in the wake of League of Legends more or less just made a MOBA with the exact same framework but like different characters. That there was really not a ton of variety in how those games actually played like strategically and even, you know, perspective wise. I feel like the Battle Royale uh, I, I'm sure it will have plenty of just like generic battle royale, you know, pieces of crap. But like, it's cool that there are so many with really identifiable, like, unique bits of design in them that nobody else is doing. Yeah, I mean, it, there are like you're right. There are like I think everyone, well, not everyone, most are trying to kind of put a different spin on it, and they don't always work out. But it's I think. I think just having this idea of we can just have a map and drop 100 players on it and we'll, you know, we'll be a successful beloved game is not the is not the way to do it. You have to at least try something a bit differently. Um, which takes us to our next Battle Royale game I played this week, The Culling 2. Um, the Culling, I'm not sure how successful or popular it was. Um, I know it had a very passionate fan base and when I first tried it in Early Access... It was a while ago. Um, I thought it was kind of it was kind of like a sloppy battle royale uh, game, but it was a lot of fun. Um, it was more about melee weapons. Right. I was gonna uh, say yeah. And was, was it pre? It was like around the same time PUBG was. It was like 2016. Yeah. I think it may have been one of the first standalone um, battle royale That's right. games that wasn't just like a mode for an existing game or a mod. Yeah, it was like 2016, I think. Um, maybe while PUBG was in beta or early access. It was, it was, it was definitely one. Yeah. yeah, it was one of the early ones. And it, was, it wasn't it was like, you know, I don't think it took the world by storm or anything, but, and it was a bit of a, it was kind of sloppy, but it was kind of fun in that it was like, there were crafting elements to it, so you'd run around and you'd craft better gear, and there was a lot of focus on melee weapons and things like bows and arrows. It wasn't just like you get to the end of the round and everyone's got a sniper rifle or machine gun. It was it was a bit more of like close quarters uh, combat type stuff. Um, so yeah, they uh, I hadn't been following their development, but they the developers um, left early access and then within a few months announced like you know that's it for the culling. We're not going to continue developing it anymore. Then very quickly announced the Culling Two, hmm. um, so not in early first access. Battle Royale sequel, right? Yeah, it might be. I think it could be the first Battle Royale sequel. <laughs> yeah, um, and kind of announced. I think a month later, uh, released, which was this week, and it's really. Um, I mean, we're just talking about generic Battle Royale. It's kind of what it feels like to me. There's. None of the crafting stuff, none of the kind of, I mean, there's melee weapons, but this is a ballistics game. You look for rifles and guns and things. Um, 
it felt to me like like I don't know landing on this map it felt like it, it kind of it reminded me of radical heights but without the 80s kind of goofy hmm. stuff without that kind of personality to it without any of the you know radical heights had like bmx bikes and zip lines and this just felt like here's a town find some weapons shoot each other um you know i didn't play it for very long but it there wasn't anything like a, a hook or anything that's really set it apart it did not feel like the culling too because when i think of the culling i think of like this crafting and this uh, kind of close quarters uh you know and bow and arrows and action that doesn't just mean you know you found the biggest gun on the map kind of thing but chris the steam page says that the culling two expands on every aspect of its predecessor <laughs> um i don't know like i i shouldn't i i can't really give it a verdict yet i'm i do plan to to write it up a bit more, but because I, I only played a few rounds, um, but it just felt like this. Like I felt like the Culling would have been a better sequel to the Culling Two because it's like, wow. hey, right. now we've added all this cool crafting stuff and these you know weird weapons and things. This this feels really. It just felt like, you know, when I when we just talked about Fear the Wolves, you talk about these new systems and these different a different finding a different take, and this doesn't feel like it has much of a take at all except for like here's a better better look the so. uh, first uh, review con customer review on the steam page uh describes the game as uh having basically lost everything that was original uh ab about the first game and says uh, it has gunplay that feels like a game demo disc from pc gamer back in the <laughs> 90s wow <laughs> thank you <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a bummer. Uh, you know, side note, I guess I kind of miss Radical Heights in the wake of all these games. Uh, as early as it was, uh, it, it, the, the personality there and, and the more like fast, like no nonsense arcadey combat was 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 kind of novel, at least in the landscape of Battle Royale right now. Uh, yeah, I kind of enjoyed like I enjoyed Radical Heights. I thought it was it was fun. I, I don't know that if it had this successful development. No. that I would still be playing it or anything, yeah. but I thought it was, I thought it had some personality and it was, it was enjoyable enough. I, you know, it's weird. It's like, it, there's such a weird balance to making a, uh, a battle royale game because you just ha you have these lulls sometimes in action where there's really not anything exciting happening except for you're gathering gear. And like, I know some games like H1Z1, I feel like they try to avoid this so much. They try to compress this action. So there's always, things going on and then some don't seem to care like originally PUBG was like yeah so it's 40, 45 minute match but who cares who cares if it's not that exciting for all of it but then then they too introduced the smaller map so, so there's more action and less time for looting um so it's you know it's a I think it's a genre that people still think it's easy to make a map and drop players in it but I think it's a really tricky balance to find a really winning formula um and you james had played rapture rejects yeah yeah so rapture rejects is maybe like i don't know it's the inverse of PUBG or something like that it's, it's meant to be it's a 2d uh, battle royale game based on the or in the uh cyanide and happiness web comic web series universe uh I, i'm Which not just somehow still a big thing yeah i'm not too familiar or much of a fan of it i see it uh like shitty like artifacted uh uh copies of it on facebook all the time <laughs> but i don't really seek it out myself so I, I don't really have any like that attachment to to this game going in um and yeah so i played a bunch in 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 closed alpha closed early alpha uh so you know keep that in mind as as you should with all these early access projects um but it it also is like for being set in this kooky universe uh also during the rapture the, the premise is that the rapture is, has happened and you are one of the remaining people on planet earth and uh, uh god is allowing extra people to make it into heaven if they win a 1d100 scenario so hooray um and you know it, 
I think seeing that trailer, that first trailer, and hearing the premise and knowing it came, comes from this uh, kooky, kooky, wacky, irreverent comic, I expected the the, the systems uh, to kind of reflect that and, and how it articulates to reflect that, but it really is just very vanilla Battle Royale. Um, it's I, not like whimsical weapons and crazy uh, contraptions. It's just running around shooting people. Yeah, pretty much it's... Least. It's it's uh, there are stand I mean there are jokey stand-ins for a lot of like pretty standard uh, battle royale stuff at this point. So you don't even parachute on in onto the island. There's no like spawning system at this point. You just and there might be later. Um, but you randomly appear in a neighborhood. Uh, it's got this 2D kind of isometric perspective. You can sort of XCOM it and change you know uh, 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 the camera angle. Um, in in increments but uh your 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 field of view is like pretty limited because you're this third person bird's eye view of this character um and you're just kind of wandering into buildings finding garbage guns there all the guns are the archetypes are there but they just shoot garbage garbage is garbage is your ammunition which is yeah you know it's like a, it's fun that's a funny thing i guess um but they they behave like those weapons right so a shotgun will just shoot garbage in a in a spread. In a shotgun blast yeah, uh, a sniper rifle will shoot garbage across long distances, like a sniper rifle. Um, yeah, that's disappointing. They there, could have been so much more creative. Yeah, and hey, well, you know, this again, like maybe that stuff is on the way, but I it, it felt like a bloated version of one of my favorite <laughs> battle royale games, Survive.io. Which is just the whole experience of Battle Royale condensed into like the most minimal presentation possible and quick turnaround, like some pretty interesting ways to hide. Like you can hide in bushes and like, you know, uh, in, in, uh, as a little dot. You can play this right now. It's S U R V I V dot I O, I believe. Just uh, pop that in your URL uh, uh, bar. And that to me is like one, one side of like what I think. Rapture Rejects gets to gets to is like well this is sort of a streamlined version of Battle Royale it's kind of like all right all these you know it's the PUBG cycle stream you know streamlined but not quite enough um, and on the other hand it's not quite unique enough among you know the, the more prolonged bigger Battle Royale games out there there's no like unique systems or mechanics that really make it different you know if it's a 2d game i would expect that you could get as experimental as something like um uh enter the gungeon with the weapon types you know especially if yeah. it's it's end of the world you know where where's where are the demon uh based you know wacky missile launchers that do jokey things that are funny i don't know <laughs> you know what would have made a way cooler setting for a 2d battle royale what's up Zombies ate my neighbors. South Park. Oh, zombies ate my neighbors. Yeah, <laughs> zombies ate my neighbors zombies. was fucking great. Yeah, that's a good idea. Like, walk around like squirt guns are your primary weapon, but you can get a power up where you turn into the giant monster and just punch people to death. You have uh, what like soda can grenades, right? Mm -hmm. One of the weapons, and then you could have the NPCs wandering around zombies that you have to deal with like mob style. Like that could be a cool freaking video game that could be a cool freaking video game Wes and, and it'd be more creative than Rapture either. yeah that's the, the the feedback I have this you know I, I would expect it changes quite a bit between now and release but uh, just just go wild I mean like in Battle Royale if you're making a Battle Royale game now you have to stand out and like replicating PUBG quickly you know uh, is, is not it's not gonna work I don't think at this point um, yeah, you, even when I started Fear the Wolves, like my first match, I was like, okay, um, I've joined the game. Oh, here I am in a, in a lobby in-game when we're running around punching each other. Here I am on a helicopter <laughs> flying over a map. Here I am parachuting. It's like, it's just beat for beat. Like, and the same thing with uh, with the Kong 2. It's like, you start in the lobby and there's yeah. other people and then you're in a... And it's just like, anything that that does something a little different just feels like such a relief it's like oh okay you thought you thought it through a bit and put a twist on it and so yeah no. well hopefully hopefully rapture rejects will 
Yeah. If it was just an outfit, hopefully they'll if I, spice it yeah, up. If I have hope for... If I if any of these games can turn it around easier, it's probably that one. But what do I know? I'm not a developer. Um, yeah, that's that's our battle royale update for this week. I expect to find you know six or seven more games next week and any more the following week. Uh, we'll, we'll play as many as we can. Um, but let's switch to another battle another battle royale game. I'm sorry, guys. I gotta I gotta spew about Fortnite for a little bit. There's a lot going on in Fortnite spew land. Spew is accurate. And you guys can comment or ask questions about any of this teen bullshit. Uh, uh, and at any time, so feel free to interrupt. But Fortnite Season Five is happening. Uh, it's actually occurring. It's the, the the changeover. The patch is going out at four a.m. EST tomorrow morning. Uh, so tell us the three things we should be interested in, excited about. Uh, it's hard to say because Epic is keeping a tight lid on exactly what's going on, but. As well as littering the world with various objects. <laughs> so much plastic. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, but yeah, I think what you should be excited about for Fortnite Season 5 are massive map changes. That's that's a pretty much guaranteed to happen. Um, with do the, you think... Sorry, sorry go on. Do you think that Epic is just going to have this map that they change gradually and change between seasons, but it's still ultimately the same map or will it ever be like, hey, here's a second map? Like, are they just going to evolve this one map and you can never go back and play the original version of it? Or I don't know. Like, but... you think that's their game plan to just constantly be changing the game and not let it kind of be a static thing? I would really hope that they get this map to a point where they're satisfied with it and then make a new map with everything they've added to the game and how people have learned to use the building system in mind. Because this this first map was not made knowing people were going to build the way they build and not knowing they were going to add jetpacks and shopping carts and yada yada. And after a certain point, I don't think it's like a Theseus ship scenario. Like they're, they're going to lose or at least like I don't think you can retrofit this map perfectly to make it something that really sees through or, or like holds up um, what that game has become without, I don't know, without making a bit of a mess along the way. Yeah. It, it would be satisfying to see a, to have a video of like side by side what the kind of style of play and building in Fortnite looked like internally at Epic before they released Fortnite Battle Royale. Like what was their QA or like player testing? Yeah. They probably have that footage somewhere. Like, you know, the best players in the company, what were they doing with the building system <laughs> at launch versus side by side, like what people are doing in that game right now? It, it would be dramatic. I can tell you that because even like one of the best players in the game, uh, TSM, myth he he was playing he's one of the earliest players of the game too and when he discovered you could build like a one by one i think he's sort of credited with it at least in the public you know uh it, perception it, it it was like a a revelation and by one by one i mean like make make a well, four walls and then put a ramp in the center that you can peek out of and that was like holy shit um so i don't even know like i bet epic internal testing was like let's put up a wall Oh my God, <laughs> that's no one's ever gonna do this. This is gonna fail. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but again, like I would hope they make a new map at some point uh, from the ground up with everything they've learned in mind. Uh, but I don't think that's gonna happen with season five. I think season five is gonna get a big map makeover. I'm pretty sure because today they announced the summer skirmish series, a duos competition, is starting this weekend. Uh, $250,000 is going up, um, and I'm betting they're starting the, uh, Epic is starting their competitive, their official, first official competitive uh, junk this weekend because the Season 5 update is going to have some sort of in-game viewer or client for watching these events, because um, they're investing heavily in, uh, in uh, competitive Fortnite. They have 100000 excuse me, $100 million dollars on the line for the first year of competitive Fortnite, And that's a lot of money. $8 million is going to this summer series. 250,000 
is up this weekend. So there's a lot of a lot of money. Um, James, are you gonna get any of that? No, fuck no. I'm so bad at this game still. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still below average, I'll say. I enjoy it though. I still enjoy it. Uh, and and the build up to season five has been really interesting, just because they did this really cool in game rocket event that happened once in the world, and you had to be playing to see it. And I got a really great view. You can go to pcgamer.com slash Fortnite if you want to go find that. Um, and they started like doing interesting things in game and out of game leading up to uh, season five, starting with these these uh, this this rocket cracked the sky and the time space continuum went all fucky, and now all over the map these. Uh, different uh, rifts are consuming parts of, you know, these iconic parts of the map, including uh, signs from the motel and this the Der Burger uh, in, in Greasy Grove, which... <laughs> Went a, through, through a dimensional portal and ended up in... In California. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that Der Burger sign appeared in, in uh, a desert in California, and a photographer happened to... Find it and tweet it. He t- he totally got paid. I'm pretty sure. Um, oh, to that. Yeah, he would. I, there's some. Epic's got money. Epic's got money. Um, so this this recreation of the Durberger appeared in the desert. Uh, uh, a photographer tweeted it out. The community went nuts and fled to the scene. Like they 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 found I think the coordinates using metadata in the tweet and the image or photo or something and. Uh, at the scene, there was like an agent who was handing out cards. There was a phone number on the back, some weird number on the front. Uh, you call the phone number, you get this weird static sound. The next day, the sound changed. The area code was somewhere in Illinois where a meteorite once hit, which happened in season four. And so like, you know, we thought we had an ARG on our hands. Um, as time went on, llamas start appearing in Europe. All these things are happening. Uh, and it's really interesting and fun, but ultimately it's all dead ended. Like it's all time gated. Everything that people are looking into, spending hours and hours and hours decrypting and decoding, uh, using uh, they're running the audio through. What, what do you call it when you run audio through like a visual interface that uh, has hidden messages? Sounds, and I think it's called sound magic. Sound magic. That's, that's uh, magic. I don't know what it is. <laughs> It's sound magic. We'll just call it sound magic. Um, they're finding hidden messages in there, and all it's all pointing to and alluding to season five and things that you know players can find or whatever. But all of it is 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 being released day by day. Players are dead ending themselves, getting frustrated, and ultimately, it's starting to just feel like a big marketing campaign for season five. It's- is this is this going to end up being, or has it ended up being a like be sure to drink your Ovaltine situation? <laughs> I, what do you mean by that exactly? Just uh, have you seen a Christmas story? Yes. So yes. Ralphie, right? Oh like, yes. This he gets in the secret society of having his own decoder ring, and then the message uh, that he decodes off the commercial is be sure to drink your Ovaltine. Like it's just a straight up ad. Just an ad. Almost certainly, almost certainly, and I went from like interested because I like a good ARG, uh, right? Um, it, it, it there have been good ones in the past, and this had all the makings of one. Uh, it was so elaborate, or at least like at first glance, um, and there were so many things, so many strange coincidences that felt like they couldn't be dead ends, but ultimately ended up being dead ends. That it's been super disappointing and annoying quite frankly to just realize you're being marketed to and that every ARG is marketing sure but some of them are just interesting games or or, or puzzles um and the I, Binding of Isaac one a couple of years yeah, ago was great yeah uh that one ended up with people like digging up shit based on <laughs> like, like GPS coordinates and finding something um yeah. and and I believe it affected when um Edwin McMillan actually like released some stuff in the game or some something yeah. like that. Like it had a it had a payoff that wasn't just oh here's you a hear trailer about Binding of Isaac. This is this game that we we made. Go exactly. Play it now. Instead There's of instead of drink like drink your oval team, there was just like a fuckload of oval team there, uh, buried in the ground the dirt. Um, it was like getting a new <laughs> flavor of oval team. Yeah, hell yeah. When are we gonna get one of those, by the way? Um and it, it had me wondering. I don't know, man. That's a good question. 
chat. Uh, made me wonder, like, have you guys ever been invested in an ARG? And if so, like, do any, what do you think the best one in, in the history of ARGs was? Any, any particularly awful standouts come to mind? I always feel, I mean, they're always awful to me because, <laughs> like, I can't call a number and get some kind of static and run it through a fucking deco. <laughs> like, I can't do that stuff. Like, I can read about other people doing it. I can be like, wow. So you were playing Portal and you noticed the radio when you brought it to a certain area in the level was playing this and you ran it backwards through a, 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 some sort of, you know, World War II field phone that you <laughs> happen to have and you uploaded it to this Radio Shack equipment from 1987 like that's really genius and stuff but it's not stuff i can personally participate in because i'm not a smart person who knows how that works so like i can appreciate that kind of like craftsmanship um but a like i just there's no way i can participate in that stuff because i'm not smart and b like you know what is what you know what are the end results of these args like you're saying that that is that winds up being satisfying sometimes it's just like I don't know what, like it wouldn't. To me, it's like, what is the result? Like, what do we gain from it? And if it's never solved, does that have any effect, or does the stuff just, you know, no one's gonna be like, well, I was gonna release our Portal Three, but no one solved the ARG, so <laughs> Too bad. we just won't never release it. <laughs> so I guess that's kind of. I guess it's it's fun to read about and see the kind of work and uh, imagination that goes into these things, but like, I never really really get to really participate in them i i remember um 10 years ago now people being or more than 10 years ago people being really into i love bees i think that was the first uh, arg that i ever two? was aware of and it was for yeah it was for halo 2 uh that was like um obviously there's a website that went with it and then it had some kind of like audio drama kind of element which mm -hmm. was i think the things people like unlocked as they progressed through the game and eventually i think it tied into a promotion for halo like you could um either like win a free copy of the game or like get it early or get a special edition or something so like it did have a, a payoff i don't know if the payoff was as satisfying as just like solving the the puzzles or, or whatever uh from the game but i remember that one like having you know, this is kind of pre Reddit having like g giant communities, but I remember there were tons of people obsessed with that one and solving yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, similarly, the ARG leading up to the announce of Portal 2, I think was I think was pretty good as far as ARGs go. Did it have something to do with potatoes? Yeah. So I think I forget how many games, uh, but a bunch of indie games got mysterious updates, and. With, by, from playing each game or digging through its files or accomplishing something within, you would find some piece of the puzzle or, or get a potato achievement. It's, it's been so long, I can't remember the specifics of each game, but uh, it, it, it kind of put a highlight or you know it put the spotlight on these indie games, which maybe, especially back then, didn't have a huge audience to begin with. And then, I, you know, the, the the pieces taken from those indie games were then pretty elaborate themselves. I know like there was something about like, gosh, uh, using ages old uh, internet modems to uh, tap into some you know shitty old BBS uh, interface and and find some crazy you know uh, coordinates or I don't even fucking remember but I remember just being That's pretty cool yeah yeah it was actually a puzzle and there was actually like pieces and it required playing games you know it required playing games to to solve um and that was fun if you want to hide if you want to hide some shit that no one under the age of 30 is going to find put it on a bbs <laughs> <laughs> it will stump uh, your teenage audience very effectively I will I'll make a note because chat brought it up uh sombra's I'm not an Overwatch player, but uh, I do know Sombras was particularly bad. It led, you know, I think there was a countdown that led to another countdown that maybe led to a third countdown or something. I don't think that's an ARG. That's just a bunch of countdowns. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty boring. Those are learned. Um, Psych, it's another countdown. <laughs> Psych. 
But yeah, uh, Fortnite Season 5, not the best ARG. Hopefully it's a an interesting update. Um, the, the rumors are it's going to be a big history thing, a, a big history mishmash um, with maybe a Wild West area and a, a prehistoric jungle and a yada yada based on all these clues um, and uh, models that have been spawning into the map, which would be cool. That, that, that map could use some visual variety at the very least and some... Uh, some updates to its more, you know, plain areas. Um, but let's move on to uh, listener questions for the week. Uh, if you have a question for us about video games, um, life, uh, we've had questions about rent, good places to rent, how to how to find good places to rent. We can maybe we can help you with that. Um, just tag in, Sa- in San Francisco. <laughs> Not in San Francisco. Just, don't just, just don't <laughs> in San Francisco. Uh, tag PC Gamer and Twitch chat. We will favor questions from our PC Gamer Discord. So uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say that, uh, we have a PC Gamer club. You can go to club.pcgamer.com to find more uh, on that. The, the essence of that club is you pay a small subscription fee, like five bucks each month. You get an ad-free experience on the website. You get access to our really cool Discord. You get a free game each month. You get uh, a digital subscription to the magazine. I think I said that already. And first access to our beta keys, alpha keys we get. I know we, like when Hunt Showdown was the thing, we sent those out to our our uh, club members first. Um, you get a high glossy JPEG of Tub Geralt. Um, and some other nice stuff, including some in-game cosmetics and anything else. We're always trying to improve it. So uh, I have some queued up right here, though. So we'll ask those first. Logic Bomb, MMG, asks, what game or time period of gaming do you miss the most? Are you guys nostalgic for a particular year, decade, century in video games? Well, kind of the nice thing is, like, there's so many older games are still playable. There's not a whole lot of reason to be completely nostalgic. I mean, some games have kind of slipped away. I still do wish I had, like, my Apple II because I played a bunch of like uh, adventure games and text adventure games and like you can still play them on the emulators. I I played uh, winter games back when it was the Winter Olympics, which is like um, that was a really ice fun skating and you did out of that. Yeah, and that was fun. It's fun to revisit things, and it's nice that you can almost always find a way to play a, a game from a. I guess it's not really a bygone era. That's a little dramatic, but from. The early days. Did you ever play a, a Apple II game called Shadow Keep? Shadow that might have been a Macintosh game, actually. Hmm. It sounds familiar, but I don't. I don't think I did play it. It was kind of like a classic, you know, top-down RPG kind of thing that one of my friends used to be into. Um, you know, for for me, I mean, I agree. Like, you can go back and play a lot of those games. I think if there's anything I miss, it's sort of the. Uh, the feeling of a lot of like PS1 era and PS2 era games where I think there's kind of a a few factors that go into this, but the biggest part of it is just like a lot of shit hadn't been figured out yet in the early era of 3d uh, games took very different approaches to how the controls should work, how the camera should work uh, just kind of like, what one of those games should feel like to move around in and jump and all that kind of stuff and a lot of times that was meant something pretty bad like a lot of those games are really rough when you go back and play them and i think there's sort of a charm in like that era of games them just figuring shit out basically oh did we just lose chris i think we just lost chris there's chris and he's back he's back um but, but yeah, like a lot of the that era of game uh, two falls into that zone where you could have like a mid budget game, and you know it only cost a couple million dollars to make, but felt substantial yeah. in a way that doesn't really exist now. Like the AAA has gotten bigger, and indie has gotten more indie, and you know there are a few of the indie developers who kind of hit that middle ground now, but it's it's not as common uh, to have kind of a game from like. Capcom be like kind of a you know 
forty dollar game or whatever thirty dollar game the, from from that era. So I miss that style of game development, that style of of gameplay in a lot of those games. That like they're definitely not classics, but there's just some character to them that we don't necessarily see as much anymore. Cool, good answers. I'm not nostalgic, so meh, meh. That's my answer. Ugh. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Gene Zod asks, Battlefield 5 or Black Ops 4? Go. Go where? <laughs> which one? Which one? Which one? You, which one would you prefer in a realm where you had to pick pick one? Um, I don't, you know, like, I can't really bash Call of Duty. I know it's, um, there are always something great about them, even though I do prefer... I'm not so much into like linear type uh, campaigns. Oh it, wait, is this the no one campaign, campaign this year? Oh. Battle Royale oh, though. Ba- Both Battle, Battle Royale and multiplayer. Year. Yeah. So forget that. Scratch that. I'll do Battlefield. <laughs> All right. I like the Battlefield sandbox, but I I used to love the Call of Duty Zombies mode. I feel like I probably played enough of it. I don't yeah. know that I ever need to play it again. But if I got the itch, that would be potentially a big hook. They are super elaborate now. I play because I reviewed World War II, and uh, I played a lot of it at um, uh, uh, Raven Raven Studio, uh, the developer, uh, and I played with a bunch of t- game testers there, uh, who took me through like some of the later like stages of the campaign, the zombie camp. And there's some elaborate. It's like it's like adventure game puzzles during horde mode. <laughs> it's like it, it's fucking weird some of the shit that you have to do in those games to progress um yeah i don't know how i feel about that because the it, on the one hand it's really cool on the other hand the big appeal of that mode was there's a mystery box that gives you a random gun and you go to that and then you run away to some part of the map that you can defend really well and just see how long you can last and like it was it was sort of that kind of like killing floor two of like this purity of you do this one thing and then you shoot the zombies as long as you can. And like the satisfaction was in that sort of obsessive, like what's the best place on the map we can find to defend. And then just doing that until you get sick of the game and stop playing it basically. Yeah. I mean, I'm with you there. I didn't, I I wasn't a fan because I don't know how I would begin to solve that stuff, but it is different. I'll give it that. And black ops four is having what three zombie, two to three zombie campaigns out of the gate. Um, so if you're into that, that's great. I think for me, I prefer Battlefield's multiplayer in general, but I, I'm really curious to see how each of these games tackle Battle Royale. Uh, we haven't really heard much about either of them besides that they exist. We do know that Call of Duty's will be sort of a mishmash of the series past. And I, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but I believe some of the old maps from the series will be sort of part of this larger map in general. So you'll still get maybe some of those uh, microcosms of Call of Duty stop and pop shooty stuff, but spread out in this weird dreamlike uh, island. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. They should make it. They should make it like a um, like gun game battle royale. So just every time the uh the circle shrinks or whatever everyone's weapons are randomized and you get weapons from like different they switch between eras of call of duty games so like oh, that could be fun. the beginning of the game you're everybody has like crazy laser guns or whatever shit from black ops and then like five minutes later everybody's using tommy guns from world war ii uh, yeah just, was... just make it weird i think the breadth like the if if they have a lot to pull from to be wacky. And I think I like wacky battle Royale above all else, which is sort of why I like Fortnite so much. Um, so I'm really curious to see that like battlefield. I hope they don't go too predictable, right? Just battlefield, but a hundred people but that would be kind of, kind of lame. Um, and I don't think it would maybe catch on as well as they hope, but I don't know. We'll see. Has Battlefield ever been wacky, though? No, and like, and that's fine. That's fine because I don't expect the you know I don't expect it to be, um, but I don't think it would do any favors for whatever Royale mode they come out with. Um, 
Anyway, next question. Uh, here's a good one. It's the summer. So Chris86 asks, with the current lack of big releases, have uh, has anyone managed to reduce their backlog? You guys, you guys pouring through that backlog? You just checking them off? I don't believe in the backlog. Don't stress Whoa. yourself out over this list of like no. things you need to do before you die. Just <laughs> play the games that you want to play and stop, stop obsessing. Let it go. Yeah, I don't really think about a backlog either. I think I like I keep so few games installed that when I open <coughs> Steam client, there's only like you know five or six things on there. It's not like it. I don't look at my huge library that I haven't played. Um, and like I said, I'm playing Daisy, so I'm not really concerned with like. I just kind of just just play what you want to play and try not to sweat over unplayed games. I'm with you. I'm with you guys. I always play them later. I, uh, there are some games I would like to finish, but I'm not losing sleep over it. Um, obviously, I have it within my power to do that, but I keep playing Fortnite and Hollow Knight again. Night games, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. There's, there's so much to play that we'll, you'll never play at all. Just, you know, uh, take your time. Enjoy your Have you enjoy been playing yourself. any Nights into Dreams? I have not playing any Nights Into Dreams. Have, have you ever played Nights? No. Is that the weird uh, jester hat looking platformer thing with the hoops? That is the, je- that is the jester hat looking <laughs> platformer thing. Yeah. You, you nailed it. I see that in speedruns only. Like I see spe- every year at uh, Games Done Quick or whatever, I see someone play that game and I'm like, that looks weird. It looks like something I would enjoy if I was eight. Not to say it's a bad game, <laughs> but I think it's like I'm beyond the point of being able to like attach my, I don't know. We don't need to know about why I do or you, do not like. You should buy Nights when it's on a Steam sale for like a dollar seventy-five and play it. It's you'll never play anything else quite like it. All right, all right, Wes, I will. I'll put it into my backlog. <laughs> Made my best friend cry when we were kids. What? When he, when he the hoopy jester-looking blap? Okay. It's a, it's a very touching game, James. I believe. I, I don't think I believe you. I don't think I believe. Oh, here's a good one. You guys ready for this one? Maniac, 86, when you pour milk on cereal, is it still a beverage, a soth? It, wait, when you pour milk on cereal, is it a beverage, a sauce, or a broth? Hmm. Are we going to do this internet meme shit? Uh, this, this Twitter conversation? I don't uh, think it's a sauce. 40 duck-sized horses. That's the right <laughs> answer. <laughs> I think it's milk. I think it's, um, we don't got to categorize it. I think it's uh, milk. Yeah. So it's a liquid juice. Uh, Could it be a soup? I think if, it, if it's anything, it's going to be a soup, like a stew. It's like a hearty. Yeah. Depends on your milk distribution. Oh, here we go. Is, there's a word for um, cold soup, right? Is it gazpacho? Is that a, I, I mean, think is that a so. Type of- that is a type of cold soup, but I guess it probably doesn't just mean cold soup. Cereal is... I think that's a specific cold soup, because borscht, oh. isn't borscht cold also? Mm. Mm. Well, if there's a word for cold soup, that's yeah. what milk and cereal cold is. Cold soup. Unless you drink your milk warm, but I'm not here to judge. Oh, who would eat warm cereal? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Man, it gets hot in the summer in Montana, Wes. Uh, well, but you're not heating it up, right? I mean, we're talking like room temperature at worst. I mean, we'll talk about this offline. We'll talk about this offline. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, let me let me take a quick look at these. Uh, oh yeah, this is a good question. Um, I don't know if any of us are Warframe people, but maybe we paid attention to it. Has Muffins asks, "What's your take on the Warframe update announced at Tenocon?" I only know the overview of what's been announced and it sounds like a lot a new open world area um hoverboards good boards well, you can do tricks uh, on them co-op spaceship like almost like ftl type battles also good it looks it looks fun it looks like they're throwing a bunch of cool stuff in to see if it works and it's it seems like they're all, they're kind of uh, I'm not super versed in Warframe, and I've only played it once briefly, but they seem to be like, this sounds like a fun idea. Let's throw it in and see how it does. So it's it's pretty exciting stuff, I think. 
I think what I'm looking forward to most for that game is if uh, their future, like, big open world areas feel um, valuable to new players. I know one of Steven's big criticisms of the Plains of Eidolon, which was their first, this, like, big open world zone they released, was there wasn't really a lot for you to do if you were just, like, a couple hours into Warframe. Like, you yeah. needed a, um, a, you know, much higher level character, which is totally fair for them to release something like that because this is a game with the install base of you know millions of people who've been playing it for several years now of course you want to give those people something to play something new and exciting um, but it would be cool if eventually as they add more of these open world zones if the, they feel like something you can go and experience you know just a couple hours into the game and like get a lot out of it yeah that's the question i, I want really to answer talk about that or not is because i mean like everything i see coming at like warframe's been one of those games I, I want to play or try, but I only want to try the new shit because everything I hear about the, I heard about Warframe prior to, gosh, whenever last year, it was that it is extremely grindy and sort of samey. And this stuff doesn't look like that. I want to play this. And is, can I do that? Can I hop in and, and do this stuff relatively quickly uh, or not? Um, so, it sounds cool. If you're if you're into Warframe, I bet this shit is like if you've been a dedicated Warframe player, I would be like, "Whoa, what the fuck?" I would be losing my mind and it looks like based on the crowd reaction there and and Steven's first-hand experience being there, that is the case because here's this game you've been playing for so long, it's sort of hitting its stride and it it's becoming more than maybe you ever expected it to be. But uh, can I play it too? We'll see. We'll see. You have the power, James. I know. I just uh, don't have time. You can be a space ninja. All these the problem with all these free to play games is that they're all getting very good at making you play nothing else. <laughs> so <laughs> you gotta pick one. Pick one. All right. But that's all the time we have for today. Um, thanks for joining us on our our second uh, digital only non studio podcast show. Uh, we're getting some new. Uh, I know someone had a question. I think uh, Mildos had a question about new layouts and, and such and new format and new everything. And I, I still want to change up the show quite a bit, but I'm, I'm waiting on getting assets in and new logos. And there's some pretty fancy stuff rolling through my email. Uh, so be patient. It's coming. We're making sure everyone – we're making sure I can, I can pull this off, first of all, uh, without too many technical hitches. And then we're making sure we get everything up to – standard uh, a nice high pretty standard before we roll it out so sit tight it's coming uh but thanks for joining me you too as always it's been a pleasure talking games My pleasure. yes yes uh, and until next week you know what's coming wes game on with me uh, game on okay what was that i didn't that's the new catchphrase show. game on yeah one two three Game, Game on! on. We'll, I, I, we'll I workshop it, Chris. We'll okay, we'll, we'll work on it next time. Chris did not get the, the notes. In I didn't get the, the notes. Episode. All right, sorry, I'll clear that. Game right. on. We'll, we'll go over this in the post-show meeting. Anyway, thanks for joining us. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye.